In next video series, uh, we'll be designing a variety of IPs for communication purpose. We'll start with an AM modulator, officially amplitude modulation with uh, double side band with full carrier. Later, we'll be also designing AM uh, single side band modulators as well as B modulators, frequency modulators, and VPSK, QPSK, different kind of modulators. Now, no matter which modulator, demodulator you are designing, in most of the design you will encounter with, you need to generate sinusoidal signals. So, in this first video, I'll be discussing about how can we generate uh, sine waves inside SPGs. There are IP echoes available from sidings uh, which can do this, but we'll be designing our own IP echoes so that we have much better flexibility. So, as you know, sine waves or cosine waves they are analog in nature, and since FPGAs are uh, devices for digital signal processing or designing digital circuits, we will not be able to generate this analog sine wave. So the approach that we have to take is sampling. So we take a continuous value sine wave and we do sampling of this signal at some fixed interval and we'll be ending up with a digital representation of this sine wave. So for example, if I uh, sample the sine wave in this format, these are the discrete values that I will, I will receive. And if you have a sufficient number of samples, you should be able to represent this sine wave with a good amount of accuracy. So as the number of uh, samples increases or as you reduce the sampling period, the accuracy will be much better, but that may require more memory to store these samples as well as you have to run it at a much higher clock frequency. So there are some upper limits on uh, how much you might be able to sample. But a sufficient number of, uh, as you know, Nyquist criteria says like you need to sample at least twice the maximum frequency. But twice one won't be sufficient for a, a good signal reproduction. So we will sample at much higher rate, right? much more than Nyquist criteria. So the basic idea is in, uh, instead of having an analog signal, we will have discrete values uh, by sampling these analog signals. That's how we are going to generate these signals or store these signals. So for, for reproducing a sine wave inside the FPGA, what we do is yeah, we take uh, a lookup table. So we will be storing these sample values in a memory, which is kind of a lookup table. And using this lookup table, we will be able to generate the sign. So look at the example here. So this is the first sample that I'm getting when I sample the sine wave, which is like zero. So I will store zero at the first like portion of the lookup table. Now, if this is my second sample, I will take the amplitude corresponding to the second sample and I will store it in the next location of my lookup table. And I repeat that process, okay? So the third sample, I take the amplitude, I store it there, fourth sample, so on and so forth. So I'll be storing uh, the samples corresponding to one entire cycle of sine wave or corresponding to uh, 360 degrees. I will take the samples and I will store it in the lookup table. Now later when I have to produce a sine wave inside my FPGA, approach is quite simple. I, I use this lookup table which has this pre-stored sample values and i will take a register and i will use it as a read pointer so like you can see the read pointer that will be running based on a free running clock that means on every clock edge i'll be changing the content of the read pointer the read pointer basically tells me from which location in the lookup table i am going to read and get the values stored there so maybe here I'm starting with uh, location zero. So I will get the value stored at location zero, which is nothing but zero. 
Okay, so that will be the output that I am getting from the lookup table. Next, I will increment the read pointer on the next uh, edge of the clock based on which the read pointer is operating. So I need a, a digital clock here, some square wave here, and only on the posterior edge of this clock I am going to change the content of the read pointer. So on the next clock edge, maybe I will increment the read pointer by one. So now it is pointing to the second location of my lookup table. So the output from the lookup table will correspond to 0 0.382, okay, so which is like my second sample. So I will continue this operation. On every positive edge of this clock, I will increment my read pointer and I will be getting the corresponding value from the lookup table. And by the time I traverse the entire lookup table, if you look at the uh, output of the lookup table with the, with the uh, period of the clock at which the read pointer is operating, you will end up getting a kind of sign there. Okay, so it is basically reproducing whatever values were stored there. Now once it reaches the maximum value here, uh, here I have only 16 samples. So once read pointer reaches 15, it will roll over and go back to zero, and it will again start reading from zero. So by repeating that, I will be able to get a kind of continuous sine wave. So this is the approach we'll be using to generate the sine wave. Now using this approach, you can generate any uh, arbitrary waveform which is periodic using this lookup table approach. So like I said before, the quality of the output may depend upon how many samples you have. So as you increase the number of samples, the size of the lookup table will also increase. So we may need more memory to store. That's the side effect. Now I can uh, play around with the same lookup table and uh, get different kinds of waves also. For example, instead of sine, I need to generate a cosine waveform. Because in the communication system, you will see when we go for modulation, uh, many of the systems they follow iq based modulation scheme in phase and quadrature phase so we will need two signals which are 90 degree apart if one is representing sine wave the other one should represent the cosine wave so there will be many cases i will need uh, cosine wave also so when i say sine and cosine uh, to tell the phase difference i always need at least two signals the phase is always referred uh, with reference to another signal okay so if i simply look at a wave i cannot say whether it is a sine or a wave or sine if i have two signals by comparing the phase i might be able to say it okay so for example if you need a cosine uh, the approach is quite simple in the previous case we started the read pointer with zero that was the initial value in the read pointer so instead of zero now i will initialize the read pointer with four when the system starts so the first sample that comes out will be one which corresponds to uh, sample time zero right so the first value will be one so again this we are doing because for cosine uh, at theta equal to zero the amplitude will be maximum at one so based on that only we are doing it here uh, and the remaining approach exactly same uh, on the fd Positive edge of this square wave, we will be incrementing the read pointer by one. So you will end up with this kind of wave. So if you compare this wave as well as this wave, they will be 90 degree apart. So this is a way to generate phase shift in the signal. You simply change the initialization value of your read pointer. Another requirement uh, will be changing the frequency of this output sine wave. Okay, so you have stored the sine wave values here, but it has nothing to do with the frequency of the sine. The frequency of the sine wave that is generated here will depend upon basically how many samples you have, because these entire samples, they represent one cycle of sine wave. So it will depend upon the number of samples and it will also depend upon the clock frequency at which my read pointer is run. So effectively, the frequency of the output sine wave will be uh, 
the frequency at which the rate pointer is incremented divided by the number of samples in the lookup table. So if you have more than more samples, uh, the output frequency will uh, reduce. I mean, the frequency of the sine wave that you get here will reduce if you use the same drop frequency for incrementing the rate pointer. Or in another way, if you want to increase the frequency of the sine wave at the output, you can simply increase the clock frequency at which the read pointer is incremented. Again, when we are using FPGS, there is a limit on the clock frequency at which you will be able to increment this register, maybe 100, 150, 200, maybe 250, it will work fine. But if you try to run it at 400 or 500 megahertz, depending upon the FPJ family, you might not be able to do it. So, 150 to 200 is a, a safe assumption, but the frequency for the pointer. Beyond that, you may not be able to do it. Okay. Again, that depends upon the family of FPJ, the speed grade of the FPJ, and the overall circuit that you have in the system. So, there, again, uh, this is another approach for getting better frequency using subsample. So in the previous approach, I was always incrementing my, my read pointer by one, right? So instead of that, in this case, I am incrementing my, my read pointer by two. So the first sample comes from location zero. Second sample is coming from location two instead of location one. Okay, so I'm incrementing my read pointer by two always. And if you compare the output that I obtained here and the output that I obtained previously, you'll see the frequency of this uh, new sine wave effectively twice the frequency of the sine wave I got before. Because I essentially did a subsampling, I skipped the samples in between. So whatever was coming at Location two here is coming at uh, sampling time one here. Okay, so that's how I, I did it. But if you notice, the number of samples have reduced. So the equation that we have seen here it is still valid. Okay, I kept the same clock frequency for reading, but number of samples I made it half of. So that's why my frequency doubled. But the quality of the sine wave also deteriorated because I have less number of samples here. That's another side effect. But again, this is a good way of getting uh, sine waves of higher frequency. So using this technique, even if you are able to run your read pointer at uh, 200 megahertz, by keeping the step size as two, you can create a sine wave whose frequency is twice the frequency of sine wave that you got by uh, running it with step size one. Now, we will have a, a short discussion about how these numbers are also stored here. So, to really understand it, you may have to look at some background materials on uh, fixed point number representation. I will briefly introduce it. Many of you might be already knowing it. If you are not aware of it, you may want to look at it. So, in this figure, uh, the numbers which are stored here, I am simply showing them as uh, floating point numbers, right? So, fractional numbers. And FPGAs, they are not very efficient in floating point operation. This discussion I have made when we discussed the neural network implementation on FPGAs also. Okay, if you go with IEEE floating point number representation, uh, the number of operations that you can do or the number of numbers that you can store is quite limited. So FPGAs are not very efficient then in floating point representation. So instead of that, we will be using fixed point, fixed point representation. Uh, here I need to correct it. This is basically a fixed point format. Okay. The content of LUTs will be in fixed point format. So when we say fixed point, uh, that means the decimal point is fixed. In case of floating point, that decimal point is not fixed, it floats around here and there. But in case of a fixed point representation, where that decimal point is, it is always fixed. For example, 
if I am using 12, it's for representing my entire number. And when I use the fixed point representation, I need to specify out of these 12 bits, how many bits are used for integer portion of the number and how many bits are used for the fractional point of the number. So since uh, in our case, when we store sinusoids, since its value is always between minus one to plus one, uh, we will need at least two bits to represent the integer part. Okay, so in some sense, one bit for storing the sign part, because by looking at the MSP, I'll be able to say whether this is a positive number or negative number. If it is zero, it's a positive number. If it is one, it's a negative number. And one bit for magnitude. That's not the case exactly. We are not using side magnitude representation. We are using, again, two's complement representation for number storage. But still, it gives some idea uh, what is the minimum number of bits I need. So if I'm using power of 12 bits for storing my number, I need two bits for integer part and remaining 10 bits for fractional part. So my number will be always some xx dot xxxx format. Okay. These two are my integer part and these 10 are my fractional part. So that's how we are going to store the numbers in the lookup table. So for example, here it is represented. Plus one will be stored as zero one followed by 10 zeros. And minus one, here you can notice on the fixed point representation, minus one will be one one followed by 10 zeros. It is not one one followed by 10 ones. Because in, in integer representation, minus one will be always odd bits becoming one. That's not the case in fixed point representation. Uh, fixed point representation, if you use uh, this case, this is the smallest negative number that you can store actually. Okay. So minus one is uh, stored as one, one, zero, 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 zero. So how do I know it is minus one? So first of all, we need to look at the sign. It is one. So I know it's a negative number. And you take the two's complement of this entire number. So the two's complement of this entire number, again, you can do one's complement plus one. Or a shortcut to find two's complement is you scan the right number from the right hand side until you find a bit which is one. So until you find a bit which is one, you, you re, uh, write the same numbers here. So this is where my first one is coming. So I write that one. And all the remaining are uh, zeros. So I will have 10 zeros there. So once you encounter first number, everything after that should be complemented. So this one will become zero. So two's complement of this number is zero, one followed by 10 zeros. Or you can try one's complement plus one one. So you'll end up with the same thing. And in fixed point, yeah, I have two bit integer, so it is zero one dot zero 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 so. So this is nothing but minus one. But if you look at this number, again this is minus, and to find the number, I need to find the two's complement. So I keep the first one here itself. That is the first one that I encounter, and everything after that should be complemented. So I will end up with zero zero dot. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, nine zeros followed by one. So this is a really, really a small negative number in this case. Okay, so uh, yeah, so again, if you see the content of the memory, there is no representation of this uh, decimal point. That's the beauty of fixed point number representation because it is saying the decimal point is fixed. Its location is always uh, two bits after right i will have two digits after that i have the decimal point so it is always implicit because of that uh, we don't store that decimal point anywhere if you look at the memory the table content plus one will be simply stored as this in binary format and minus one will be simply stored as this that's what we are going to see there. okay so that's about the theory part now we will go ahead and design it. So first task is to generate the content of the lookup table. Again, we will be taking help of Python for that. Using Python, 
uh, we will generate the content of the lookup table and we will use that content in our with local link. So this is the code. Uh, so I am storing those uh, values in a file called labdata.mif. MIF is a memory initialization file. MIF extension is used because uh, assigning tools, they understand the file format. They know this is a memory initialization file. That is nothing but a text file. Okay. So the number of samples I am specifying here, I am uh, using 1024 samples uh, to store one entire cycle of sign okay, So I'll be using a loop where I'll be incrementing the theta value and I will find the corresponding sign value. Okay, so so basically when I run the loop, each time I'll be incrementing the angle. Since I am representing one entire cycle of sine wave, which is two pi, and then my my theta step size in the loop will be two times pi divided by number of samples. That's it. So here is that loop. So I will go from zero to number of samples, and I have this function here. Generate fixed point representation. This is that function which takes a number. This has nothing to do with anything to do with sine or cosine. This can be used for generating uh, fixed point numbers. That's it. Uh, it can take both positive and negative numbers and can give you the fixed point representation of that number. So basically, you have to give the number. What is the total number of bits used to represent that number that you need to specify? And out of this total width, how many bits are used for representing the fractional part? That also you need to specify. These are the only thing, three things you need to specify. In my case, I am using 12 bit representation and 10 bits for uh, fractional part. That's it. So again, you can look at the logic here, pretty simple. If the number is positive, what we do is we multiply the number with 2 to the power of fractional bits. So the idea is simple. So if my number is, say, in, in binary 11.1101111, some, some large number with one of If I'm using 10 bits fractional, I will be moving this decimal point 10 positions to the right. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I put it there. And I take only the integer part of the result. So I will end up with this. And this is the fixed point representation of that number. Okay, so that number will be represented like this. And this is what will be stored in the memory. But I know since I'm using two bits for integer, 10 bits for fractional, the actual number is this. Yeah, but it will be stored as this. So that is the case when the number is positive. If number is zero, it will simply represent an upper time zero because zero has representation zero here. If the number is negative, first of all, we find the negative of that number. Okay. Then this step is exactly the same. I will shift the decimal point by the fractional number of bits. And I take only the integer part of it. And here is the additional thing. I am actually returning 2 to the power of data with minus number. This is a way to find two complement of a number. Again, if you are not used it before, again, example, if you want to find two complement of 1011, say, in 4-bit representation. I'm using 4 bits for my number representation and I want to find two complement of 1011. Okay, one method that we traditionally use is find one complement and add one to that. That is one way. Other ways, like I said before, start from the right hand side and uh, scan the number until you find the first one. That first one you keep there and everything before that also you keep there and every bit after that you invert. So if I do that, here I will end up with uh, 0, 1, 0. So first one as such, this one is 0, this 0 became 1, this one became 0. That's the second method, or you can also do, if it is 4, you do 2 to the power of 4. 
which is 16.0000 and you subtract the number from that. You subtract this from that, you will end up with same result. So this becomes 10, 0, 1, 0 minus 1 is 1. Now we have 1 here, 1 minus 1, 0. Then again 1, 1 minus 0, 1. And finally 1 minus 1, 0. So you end up with the same result. Okay. So that is what is used here uh, to find two scores. So it will return that number. And uh, again, that will be uh, returned in decimal format here. We convert it into a binary because in my code, I am planning to use uh, read mem b system task in Medlo to initialize my memory. For that purpose, the memory initialization file should store numbers in binary form. Okay, that's the only reason it is converted into binary format. And again, in Python, when you convert it into binary format, there will be a prefix of 0b to avoid that prefix. Uh, we are skipping first two characters and taking only remaining one. And since this is a text file, we need to convert it into a string. And then go. So I will run my Python script. That generator dot py and here is my data. Okay. So this is the first sample which corresponds to angle zero. And this is second sample, so and so forth, which corresponds to this corresponds to two pi divided by thousand twenty-three theta, so and so forth. So you can see that it starts from zero, goes all the way close to one, then it will start decrementing again becomes zero, then minus one again back to zero. So we should be since I have 1024 samples, we should be seeing one somewhere close to uh, 256 samples. Yeah, somewhere here. So, yeah, so all these numbers look the same. This is one drawback of fixed point representation, you know, the truncation. We'll be losing some accuracy here, but it's okay. You know. Again, don't get confused. This is not a negative number if you count the number of bits here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that only 10 uh, digits are there. Because in case of Python, it will simply ignore all the preceding zeros. So this is the actual number with the 10 fractional bit. Okay, so this is the actual number. So if you want to find what is that number, we can do it. We can take any binary to decimal converter. We can put the number there. If I put the number there, you can remember this is the actual number. If I convert, this is what I'm getting. Instead of one, this is what I'm getting, which is very, very close to one. So, same way. When we are at uh, 512, it should become 0 again. Close to 512. Yeah, it's not 0, it is very, very close to 0. So this number is actually this one followed by 8 zeros. Then 1. So this is that number. This number, if you see again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So all 12 bits are there. And the M must be is 1. That means this is a negative number. And if I want to find what is that number, I need to find two complement of this number, which will be nothing but this yeah, first digit itself is 1. So this will remain 1. Everything else I need to flip. So I have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 0. This 0 also flips. 1, but the last one, it doesn't flip. This is the case. Now, now this only converter, they cannot directly find negative numbers in two complement format. You need to convert it like this, then put it here. 
This is the number convert. So it is minus 0.00229. Okay, so that's the interpretation. And finally, if I take sample number it is 768 sample. So 68. This one, this should be representing my minus one. So again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All 12 bits are there. It is a negative number because this bit is one. And to find the number, I need to find two scoring one. So again, first bit is one. So that remains there. And everything else flips. I will end up with uh, 0, 0 and followed by 9 ones and this one also. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is actually, it is actually minus 0 0.9 maximum. I guess what is it represent? And again, the last sample correspond to 360 degree, which is again that's it. So that's how membrane initialization file looks like. I will design the actual lookup table. So here is the video code for our lookup table. So this is the memory where the samples will be stored. Each location is 12 bits and in total 1024 locations. So in the initial block here, you can see I'm using readmembe and I use the MIA file that we just generated to initialize the memory. So since I'm using readmembe, the number should be in binary, that's why we stored it in binary format. This is the initialization of the read pointer. This is my read pointer 10 bit wide because the depth of memory is uh, 1k. So when we instantiate this one, we will be able to specify this phase. Okay, and since uh, a phase of, this is again in degree we are expecting. So since 360 degree corresponds to 1024 samples, using this equation, we'll be able to determine what is the initial for, uh, value of the read address for reading from the memory. And here is the read address increment. So every post edge, we simply increment the read address. Uh, once it reaches the maximum value, we roll back to zero. So we are incrementing by this step size. Again, that step size is coming as a parameter. By default, it is one. But again, if you want to increase the frequency, uh, some other value can be configured. One extra thing that we didn't discuss in the slide is the amplitude of the sine wave. So by default, the output amplitude will be whatever values we stored in the lookup table. But in case you want to scale it, uh, there is a provision. So that's also given as a parameter. Okay, so the output is actually the content of the lookup table pointed by the read pointer divided by whatever scale we put. Again, by default it is one, so whatever is stored comes out. But uh, there will be some cases we want to reduce the amplitude. Okay, so in that case, we can specify this one. Again, uh, FPG is not very good at dividing with the numbers which are not power of two. So in practical cases, this amplitude scale will be always some power of two or four or something like that. Okay, so that's what is used here. So that's it. So to test it, uh, there is a test bench also. So to demonstrate different capabilities. So we have a 100 megahertz clock generated here. There is a 200 megahertz clock generated here. And I have instantiated multiple uh, lookup tables here. So first lookup table is the, is the traditional one, which is getting a 100 megahertz clock. And here is the output from the lookup table. 
Second one is to demonstrate how to get a faster sine wave. Uh, so that we are getting by feeding with the higher feed point or clock frequency. So 200 megahertz clock we are feeding here. This one is to demonstrate how to get speed up using subsampling. Maybe I will feed that one also with 100 megahertz. And here I am giving a step size of four. So read pointer will be incremented by four actually. So the sign that I get here, it should be four times faster than the sine wave that I uh, get from here because of subsampling by four. This is just to show the scaling one. Uh, so here we will be dividing the output by two. So the amplitude of sine wave should be half compared to this sine wave here. And this is for generating cosine. So the phase I am specifying as 90 degree. So I should get an output with a 90 degree phase shift. And we add all of them to a Vivado project. This lookup table is fully uh, synthesizable. I have added my lookup table memory initialization file as my design source and the test bench that we have seen as my simulation source. So here are the output from the five different lookup tables. We run it for some time. Now it it is shown as uh, simply numbers here. So these are the numbers coming out of lookup table. Now we were to simulator. It has a very nice feature where you can ask the simulator to treat these numbers as some samples from an analog signal and display the analog signal to me. So first I will change the radix to signed decimal because we will be uh, looking at sine wave which are signed in nature. Then we can simply say waveform style to analog. So you can see it is it is displaying the sine waves. Yeah, so we want to interpret the values here as some samples and it is showing it as a uh, analog signal. So this is the sine wave that we get at 100 megahertz. Since we, we, we are using 1024 samples, the frequency of this will be approximately 98 kilohertz, something like that. So this is the sign at uh, 100 megahertz. This is the sign we get at uh, 200 megahertz. So you can see it is faster in nature. This one, we got it by subsampling. So we subsampled by four because of that, you will see the frequency is four times compared to uh, this sign. This sign is a scaled one. So the amplitude of this sign is half of this one. Again, visually it is not clear, but if you check the amplitude here, it is 1019. The same time, the corresponding value here is 509 and again finally the cosine which we uh, got by specifying the phase as 90. So here if I compare the phase yeah I can see this this signal is leading my sine wave by 90 degrees. So it's kind of representing my cosine wave. Now one final thing again the numbers that you see here is the numbers stored in the memory but in decimal format. But you know sign value is between R minus one to one and we stored it in fixed point representation because there are certain cases you want to see the output in the exact uh, value. That means the value here is not 1019. This is some value close to one. So if you are using fixed point representation and if you want to see what is that exact number, Again, in Vivada Simulator, we can go here and we can go to uh, waveform style analog settings. There we can say I'm using, uh, sorry, not here. I can go to radix here and real settings. And here I can specify it is using fixed point, it is sign number, and the binary point is 
at that because we are using 10 bits for fractional part, 2 bits for integer part. So once I say that, it will be showing the actual number again because of scaling, it is not clean. So I can again go here, waveform style, unlock setting, and the Y range I can specify. Again, since it is sine minus 1 to 1 will be the range. So now it will show the actual value. Okay, so these correspond to the correspond to the values stored in fixed point representation in the memory. Okay, so in the next video, we'll be using these sine waves and we'll be using them as carriers and uh, baseband signals and we'll be doing different kind of modulation. Okay, see you. Thank you.